I, I read a great book called Rocket Fuel, where they talk about the great pairings of having a visionary and an integrator. You know, Ray Kroc has Fred Turner, Walt Disney had Roy Disney. Can you talk about that story, how you moved from that operational role and kind of thriving in what you're doing now? Yeah, I can, I can go. I love talking about that because it's <laughs> yeah. to me, it's a pretty interesting story. I lived it, uh, but it's a pretty interesting story. So, so we started Trimera 15 years ago, and I came out of public accounting, like I said, and just by default took over a managing partner role at Trimerit. You know, my partner who started this with me is an engineer. I was a CPA. I thought, oh, I know, I know how to run a tax type <laughs> firm. Um, so I took over that role and we continued to grow and had some pretty nice growth. Uh, uh, um, and then eight years ago, and we can go into this or not, however you want, but eight years yeah. ago, I had a stroke and it kind of had me rethink everything that I would do, everything I looked at. Um, and, and the mental health thing I would mention at the beginning, I, I, I went through some mental health struggles. Welcome to AFO Wealth Management Forward, a podcast about finance, accounting, technology, and entrepreneurship. We apply our decades worth of experience and insight into what makes businesses work so we can help others grow both personally and professionally. In this ever evolving marketplace, we help accounting firms and financial advisors grow their practice through the adoption of holistic wealth management services. Learn from industry leaders and subject matter experts to unlock the secrets of their success a podcast that shows people and companies the transformative power of technology so they don't fear it, but instead harness it. Don't fight the robots, team up with them. And here are your hosts, Rory Henry, Director of Business Development and CEO Rob Santos of Arrowroot Family Office. All right, everybody. Once again, I'm joined by Will Hill of Will Hill Consults. Will, how are we doing today? Rory, I am doing fantastic. How are you? I am doing excellent. It's Monday. Uh, it's a uh, can't complain, uh, but I'm ready to get the, the work week uh, off to a good start because we have a great guest with us today. Uh, I am excited to have him on. He is the host of the D Unique CPA podcast and co founder at Tri Merit Specialty Tax Professionals. He's an author, uh, an educator, a lecturer, a craft beer enthusiast, and an all around great guy. I've been on his podcast, so I want to welcome him to the show, Randy Crabtree. Welcome to the show. Rory, thanks for having me here, and Will, great to see you today, and um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. All right. Randy, to start things off here, we always try to get an origin story, uh, so if you give our audience a little bit of background on yourself, like who is Randy Crabtree, uh, and then just tell us a little bit about what uh, you do at Trimerit. All right, so so origin, we're not going back to date of birth then. No, we're, no, we're, we're not that far back. <laughs> all right, uh, so a so, so little bit of background then. First, before I married, I am a CPA. I came out of public accounting, was in public accounting for a long time ago. Uh, for a long time, I got a storm out here, so I, I'm uh, trying to make <laughs> sure we get through this without my electricity going out. So we'll see how we do today. Um, started Trimerit 15 years ago, which what we are is a specialty tax consulting firm. We support tax preparers and their clients with a bunch of different tax saving opportunities, and and uh, that's what Trimerit is. What I do is pretty much talk. That's my role in the business. I go out and talk, uh, do a lot of education, as you said at the beginning, uh, host a podcast, which I have a blast with. And uh, and again, thanks, Rory, for being on there. Yeah. And uh, and just you know, out and about, talking about tax credits incentives, talking about mental health, talking about niche, talking about anything anybody wants to talk about. I'll try to put my two cents in. I love it. I love it. You know what I want to talk about, because I know you went from managing partner, Randy, and you remove yourself from that operational side. I, I read a great book called Rocket Fuel, where they talk about the great pairings of having a visionary and an integrator. You know, Ray Kroc has Fred Turner, Walt Disney had Roy Disney. Can you talk about that story, how you moved from that operational role and kind of thriving in what you're doing now? Yeah, I can, I can go. I love talking about that because it's <laughs> yeah. to me, it's a pretty interesting story. I lived it, uh, but it's a pretty interesting story. So, so we started Trimera 15 years ago and I came out of public accounting, like I said, and just by default took over managing partner role at Trimerit. You know, my partner who started this with me is an engineer. I was a CPA. I thought, oh, I know, I know how to run a tax type <laughs> firm. Um, so I took over that role and we continued to grow and had some pretty nice growth. Uh, uh, um, and then eight years ago, and we can go into this or not, however you want, but eight years yeah. ago, I had a stroke and it kind of had me rethink 
everything that I would do, everything I looked at. Um, and, and the mental health thing I would mention at the beginning, I, I went through some mental health struggles and, yeah. and that kind of led to this change. Um, and so what happened though, it took me three years to realize after the stroke that my passion wasn't managing the firm. My passion wasn't, you know, uh, processes and procedures and KPIs and, and all that. My, my passion was education and thinking of the next big thing we can do and how are we going to, you know, ex not expand as much, but how are we going to get our message out as much, which leads to expansion. Um, and so a little bit of a, a fight, I kind of fought it for a while. I don't want to change this role because it's my identity. It's who I am. I'm managing partner. What am I, why, why would I change? And it took that three years to realize, no, I'm not, I'm not managing partner. And I honestly, I'm not that good at it. Looking back <laughs> now, honestly, um, because it wasn't a passion. Yeah. And so what happened is after that three years, Andy Lane, who started Trimerit with me, he took over that role and he was built for that role. And so this wasn't just me going to something I like to do. This was him coming to do something he likes to do. He is this. I found out after the fact, I didn't know this about him. He grew up playing, building a business. That was his games <laughs> when he played, when he was a kid. He wasn't out playing baseball and, 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 you know, tag and all this. He was like playing business. And this is what his passion was. I have no idea how I didn't know this. I have <laughs> no idea. Um, but when he took over that role and just put this vision out, and now we're on this, I don't even know what it's called, EOS system we're installing now, and you guys probably know this stuff. That's not, I don't even want to think about right. that stuff. Um, he's just got us growing in this direction where we are, we are like, it's not even the hockey stick. It's like, we're going straight up through the roof right now with business-wise. But I also like taking credit for that because I'm out in the road, uh, letting everybody know what we do and, and that we're there to support them and, and help them with tax saving opportunities. So that was the, that was this role change that that I am like living my best life right now. And I can't imagine doing anything else. Sorry. Was that a long story? No, longer? that's good. All right. <laughs> no, I mean, you're living your best life. I hear you on the unique CPA podcast. Uh, I mean, I mean, obviously we have uh, had some great guests on our podcast. I saw you had an all-star list of uh, accounting thought leaders on the, the season end. Uh, and, you know, one of the guests that you had on Alan Colton, I'm fascinated with what's going on in the profession, uh, Randy, when it comes to private equity and m and I mean, he called it a tsunami of uh, private equity is coming uh, the accounting profession's way. Can you talk about that and what, what you see moving forward in the profession? Yeah, so I could. So I originally talked to Alan about this last about a year ago. He was on the podcast, and we were talking about. And this was right after the Eisner Amper, yeah. the really the first major private equity deal happened. And then we had Citroen Cooperman come in, and then we had oh, I can't remember the name, uh, Southeast. Oh, why is my mind blank? I always forget their name. But another large, you know, top forty, top fifty firm had private equity, and and when Alan and I originally talked. He was saying, okay, what they're looking for is, you know, top 20 firms. They're looking for X dollars per revenue or X dollars per partner, partner take home pay of X and, and all these bullet points of what they're looking for in private equity and how they want to come in. And what he said when I talked to him last week on the live podcast was they've, they've figured this out now in this short time that this is going to work. I still, I'm, I'm not committing to this is going to work now uh alan has, has assured me it will and i believe me he's a lot more into this and knows a lot more than i do but but he said that this is not top 20 firms anymore this is top 100 this is me top 200 this is this is just going to keep going down to where he is saying and i'm just quoting alan which i love alan he's a great guy um he's saying a year from now the accounting profession is going to look completely different than it does today. And I trust him. I don't know what that means. My only concern with private equity is I don't see the end game. I mean, because private equity doesn't want to be your partner for the next 100 years, like we have some of these firms that have been around for 100 plus years um, or you know, whatever years now, 50 plus for sure. They want to, they want to grow. And they want to get out, take their money, and then someone else comes in. I don't see how you do that 5, 10, 15, 20 times. At some point, there's an end, and I don't see what that end is. I don't understand it. I, maybe I'm not smart enough, but is that end? Every 
public accounting IPO. firm either merges up into someone else and then they you know we become the big four again and these big four are <laughs> public companies it's the it's all public i don't know i don't see the the end but right now if you're a partner in a firm and private equity comes calling, you've got a huge opportunity to cash out not only once, but if you're a younger partner, multiple times. So it's very intriguing, I'm sure, to the firms themselves, especially in where I can, you can cut me off anytime. No, no, <laughs> but, no, keep it going. Uh, especially with our aging, you know, partner base, yeah. but in the at least in the top, let's say, you know, three or four hundred firms. I mean, there's a pretty aging partner base and they have to have some kind of exit strategy and now not only do they have an exit strategy that is going to get them paid but it's going to get them paid more than they expected to get paid when they originally put this plan together so it's it's an interesting thing i just want to see what happens in the long run will do you have something yeah so i have i have said with the utmost authority of zero knowledge um <laughs> that I, I can envision a world where this influx of private equity accelerates some of the role adjustments at the mid to top level of firms. And so as, as I'm thinking about that, I'm, I'm thinking around where uh, those that say, hey, I want to do something else and different, but it may didn't, maybe it didn't fit into the old structure. And so I could see a world where PE lends itself to more organizational structure shifting within firms. And what made me think about that was also your story, Randy, of, hey, you stepped out from managing partner to do something different. And that sort of a shift becomes a little bit easier and more comfortable perhaps in a PE world. So your response there. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And, and also, like you said, he comes in, private equity comes in. Now we can, we wanted to get into HR consulting. We just have yeah. have the opportunity. Now we have this PE money that we can just go acquire an HR firm. And now if that's my passion, I can go be on the HR side, or I can be on the IT side, or I can be on the you know uh, financial services side or whatever that side is, uh, because now we have more opportunity. So I, I think that's great. Honestly, I, well, I don't really want to be a partner in a CPA firm. I, I just, that's not my passion anymore. But man, I'd like to see what those opportunities are right now because the, the money is just, is just big. And I'm hoping it's not just a greed money thing. And I don't think it is. I think there's other opportunities for it. And what you just said, well, if I can, if I can get into something I'm a lot more passionate about um, just because we have private equity money coming in, I think that's huge. Yeah. yeah. So let me shift gears for a moment because you said something else about your your role and enjoying that education piece. And I've said for a while that my one of my favorite parts of working with accounting firm owners is that they have hearts of teachers and that they care about the knowledge of their clients. Sometimes accounting firm owners or leaders in firms miss the fact that their clients need to be educated. And there's probably some signs that they overlooked give our audience just some things to look for or say, Ooh, now is time for education of some sort. <laughs> yeah. I, so I can speak to what, I, what I see. And so, so what I see in an education standpoint is that, that uh, firms in general are, are busy. Firms have been swamped. They've been swamped forever, but the last two and a half years they've been swamped. And so they can't as a CPA firm, as a tax preparer, you can't know everything. It's, it's just the case. You know the tax code exists. And I'm going to talk the tax side of it because that's my passion and we've already decided I stick to my passions. Uh, accounting is not a passion at all. Um, in fact, I probably am the worst accountant out there that, <laughs> for being a CPA. Um, but what I see is that, that, that the tax preparer, and I usually say CPA because I am one, and then I could say EA, I could say tax preparer, I could say whatever. So I try to, to, to let that know. But the bottom line is there's huge tax saving opportunities out there that they just don't know exist. They have an idea. Um, one thing I could point out is two and a half, uh, let's say a year and a half ago, when the ERC really went through, employee retention credit went through major changes. CPAs were in the middle of this nonstop tax season and they knew this opportunity was out there to help the clients. They had no bandwidth, and I hate using that term, but they had no bandwidth. Uh, I am going to use it. They had no <laughs> bandwidth to do it. And so I wasn't even at that time looking to be 
doing employee retention credit as a service. I just got intrigued with it. I, I like, there's just certain things I like learning. So January, I remember the date and I remember who I heard it from. Uh, January 7th of 21, I was listening to Tony Nitti speak on a, at a conference and he starts talking about these changes in the employee retention credit. I'm going, holy cow, this is unbelievable. The amount of money that's available for these businesses that need it. And so what I started to do is just dig into it and learn everything I could. And then I was going to start educating on it. At that point, it wasn't even going to be a service. I was just, I love educating. And I was learning so much. Uh, internally, somebody uh, in our firm said, well, we have to do this as a service. There's just, there's a need because these CPAs are so busy that they don't have an opportunity to do this, but their clients need this. I told them, if you want to put it together, I'll let everybody in the country know what this is. Um, but I am not going to run the program. Again, stick to my fun and my passions. <laughs> Um, and so from an education standpoint, what I see is there's just things like that. There's, there's, there's all these, the, the tax code is, you know, whatever, a mile high. And you could be an expert in little pieces, little quarter miles of it, or not even quarter, you know, a fraction, a, a yard of it at a time. You can't be an expert in everything. And so educating, being able to have opportunities where you can go out as a CPA, as a tax preparer and learn from someone else who has this expertise, I think is just huge. And I have, a, I have this philosophy of share my knowledge whenever I can. I, I'll educate you as deep as I can. And unfortunately, it would take a long time for me to make you an expert in very much everything we do. But I know if I educate people enough, they're going to realize, hey, they know what they're talking about. Um, let's go talk to Randy and, and let's see if they can help us with our, our clients. Yeah. I mean, that really goes no, into the, go ahead, Will. I was going to say that yeah. that what you just said at the end, Randy, has often been what some firm leaders have used either as an excuse or the reason, to pass. Yeah. I'm not going to judge motivation, <laughs> for not getting into some of the advisory side of, of selling their relationship. Right, and say, ooh, but if I tell them everything I know, they won't need me. No, if you tell them what you know, they will trust your expertise and realize that it's so deep, they can't even touch it and they will want it even more. It's a yeah. little bit counterintuitive. You just have to have confidence in it. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I had to stop tongue. and it's just because there was so much. Was, and, and I just, all right, let's you know, continue. That's right. good. It's good. Um, we're, I mean, where do, leave off, where do we leave off? Well, do we go on the next question? Uh, I'll go. Yeah, sorry. go ahead. Just yeah, jump just in. Screw, I just screwed <laughs> no, this producer up Randy. <laughs> I got I no didn't have time this to plug my Yeti in before we got started. <laughs> so. You're good. You're good. I mean, yeah. All, sorry. Yeah. So, Randy, this kind of goes into niching, though. So, you know, I know you're passionate about niching. Uh, you went from a generalist to now, you know, niching and being able to educate uh, a, a niche and be able to really dive deep and provide, you know, that, that service offering is valued. Can you talk about that importance in, of going into that niche and why you believe yeah. so perfectly in it? Yeah. And, and so I didn't even realize I kind of fell into a niche. I didn't even realize that, that there was an opportunity for this. R and D tax credits kind of just came calling to me because when I was in public accounting, I was a generalist and proud of it. Hey, like, like we were just talking about with Will, I, I know parts of the tax codes exist. I know there's other people that could probably help me or I can dig in. At the time, I probably wasn't Googling it because that was a while ago, but yeah. I knew there was, you know, I knew if I had a LIFO project, I knew somebody that did LIFO. I knew there was experts out there in this. Um, I, I left public accounting and this is another story, but probably not time for that. One, I just got burnt out. We built our firm too tax heavy, but I was so fortunate that that happened, if not in hindsight, because that allowed me to realize that there's niche opportunities out there. And by being a niche expert, that's, again, my passions, my passions are educated. I can learn all this stuff and I can go educate and I can go out and share this knowledge. And when you do that, and we just talked about this, that, and, and we'll say that this is not your clients going to do it by themselves then just because you shared your knowledge. It is they understand you're the expert and you're the go-to and you can do this. So, so when we started building out this niche practice, I just so quickly realized this is so much more fun than dealing with a fast food restaurant and then a construction company and then a, a medical office. And those were great clients to talk to. And I probably would hurt those clients because I wasn't an expert in every one of those industries. 
by being a niche, no, I'm an expert in this portion, which for me happens to be a portion of the tax code. Yeah. But I think the same thing within a public accounting firm. If you could be a niche expert in an industry, I think that is gigantic because you can do, no, hey, my ego's going to shut through, but you can do what <laughs> I do is become that expert in certain aspect, whether it's a code, whether it's an industry. And, and you can go out now and, you know, when you're talking, Everybody knows that, let's assume your niche is restaurants. You're the restaurant guru. They're going to go to you because you know everything about restaurant. You know pricing. You know inventory control. You know, you know, uh, every, and I don't even know those. So that, I'm not an expert in <laughs> restaurant. But all of a sudden, you know that. And you yeah. gain this, this following. People realize their word of mouth comes out that, hey, you know, Will is the restaurant uh, uh, expert. Let's go to Will with uh, any questions we have or if we're going to start a new restaurant or if we need to change uh, our accounting firm. Uh, it's just, I can't, and even if you're a big firm, uh, I'm getting passionate now. I'm just jumping sentences. <laughs> uh, even if you're a big firm, doesn't mean you have to be a niche in just one, one. thing. You, you need somebody passionate to come in and run whatever, that your trucking niche, your craft brewery niche, your medical niche. And if that's their passion, and then that shows through to the clients, you're just gonna, you're just gonna go through the roof because people are gonna feel that passion and that knowledge within you. So niche, whether it's an aspect of the tax code or it's an industry, or even I'm a partnership niche expert. And because partnerships are, I don't want to be a partnership expert. That's a, it seems like a pain in the butt to me, but people that do it, I give them so much credit because that they are unique uh, situation unto themselves. So I feel you really need to do that to, to become an expert at what you're doing. Yeah. And to kind of go back here, Randy, I'm interested on what you see moving forward because we had this influx of cash. We had the PPP, we have the ERC, but that those government funds, those government programs are going to cease to exist. And those businesses aren't going to be flush with cash. What do you see uh, happening here in regards to the profession? Because we may have a downturn in the economy. It looks, looks like that could happen. You know, you know what are your, your views uh, moving forward? Well, that depends. If company is not profitable, they're not going to need me anymore. So I guess I'm out of business. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I'm no expert at that. I'm no expert at, you know, predicting what's going to happen. Right. I just think if you're a business and you're dealing with somebody who in a public accounting setting, a CPA that is, is there on your behalf, knows your business from a niche, knows the tax code or has experts to bring in, you put yourself in a great situation. So that's the thing that it, it, as, a, as a taxpayer, you've got to get that. And, and I think Will said at the beginning or where you did just this, uh, you know, client accounting, their advisory services, you've got to get that best advisor for you personally. And I think that's invaluable in a down economy as yeah. much as an up economy. Um, yeah. And so we've seen that the last two and a half years anyways. Now, if we have a change in the down economy, we're gonna, it's going to even be more valuable, I think. I always ask my guests on the podcast, Randy, because the advisory, the term, uh, you know, is uh, can mean different things to different people. What do you, uh, how do you define the term advisory for the CPA? Well, yeah. So, so selfishly, I, de I define it as tax advisory. <laughs> Whenever I'm talking <laughs> advisory, I talk the easiest way to eat. Everybody has their own definition of yeah. what, let's say, CAS is. You know, right. client advisory, client accounting, client accounting advisory, advisory service, whatever. Everybody has their own definition. As long as you define it yourself and your clients understand it, it doesn't matter what definition you use. This is our, how we look at advisory. And so for me, I look at advisory two steps, me advising tax preparers to advise their clients on tax saving opportunities. So for me, advising is education. For them, it's being able to identify clients that they can bring tax saving opportunities for. That's uh, that's how I define it. But I mean, in general, you know, I'm a cash flow analyst. I'm advising on that. I am an inventory analyst. I'm going to advise on that. There's just so many definitions out there. As long as there's a, a service up and above Here's a good. Here's the. Here's what I say. In the, up in the, <laughs> besides that, you get right. You got to cut me off at some point. No, keep going. <laughs> man. I love it. You get passionate. What I say is that that anybody can be a reporter of what happened. Yes, I can report what you did during the last year. I can do your accounting. Not me. Somebody else who's good <laughs> at it can do your accounting. 
and report what happened. Anybody can prepare a tax return. Here's what your books are. Here's what it is. An advisor affects the bottom line. Whatever part of the business it is, an advisor, in my mind, affects that, whether it's a tax base, that tax issue, whether it's an accounting issue, issue, whether it's just helping you from a growth standpoint to go get the newest, uh, best SBA loan, whatever it is, but be it be be an effector of that client's businesses to help them move forward rather than a reporter of what happened. Yeah. That's where all the real the real margin is. You know, and I I know you're part of the Intuit Pro Tax Council. I think you were just starting when we talked on your podcast and they just rolled out their tax planning software, Randy. So they're going into this advisory, the more of this future facing services. Uh, can you talk about any of the work you've done with Intuit here and you know, are are we seeing a, a more a wider adoption of more future facing advice and tax planning? Well, I think advisory and software is going to continue to grow. Yeah. And like you said, I'm not. This is not a sales pitch, but um, <laughs> Intuit does have their uh, software that's just rolling out. In fact, I'm very fortunate I get to speak at the rollout conference on this i think they Ooh. call the summit i think it's an invite only thing so i don't think it's a huge kind of it's not like cpa connect where there's right. gonna be whatever thousands of people in in december in vegas this is a smaller crowd but it's a it's kind of the rollout official launch of the software so i get to speak at that uh in october and and my whole speaking is going to be what we just talked about the tax advisory because that's what the software is identifying opportunities which the software is going to help you do once you identify okay there is this opportunity what is it what's the value of it does it make sense to go forward um and so that's i haven't written it yet and so uh but that's where i'm leaning towards is is doing that and so it's pretty cool when i got asked to be on the council this was something that they said that the one of the reasons that they asked me to do it is because this advisory software was coming out so it, I, I i'm hoping to be able to affect uh, a change, change in those software developments going forward and I help tax preparers identify even more opportunities using technology. Awesome. All right. Well, let's talk uh, lastly here about mental health because I know you're passionate about this, <laughs> Randy. Um, I know you went through a, a stroke here and, and you are helping other uh, CPAs out there, others in the profession, you know, live uh, 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 an improved quality of life. Can you talk about what you're doing on the mental health side? Yeah. So this is I seem like feel like I said passion a hundred times today. But, <laughs> this is the passion again, podcast. This <laughs> is the hey, I have to start a new podcast called the Passion Podcast. The passion. I like that. I'm assuming somebody has that name. I don't know. I don't know. But we're gonna so so for me, we talked about eight years ago I had a stroke. I struggled with mental uh, health issues for about four, four and a half years afterwards. And and it was, you know, I had a stroke. I was so fortunate. I mean, I I am, I think it's 8% of people that have a stroke end up without any deficits. So, and I may be quoting that percentage wrong. I've been saying it for a while, so hopefully I'm right. <laughs> um, but I ended up having no deficits that, um, well, that I can tell at least. Um, and um, so I shouldn't have had an issue. The problem was four days after I had my original stroke, I had a second stroke, small, but a second stroke. And then after that second stroke, Every single time I felt something in my head and we all feel oh, no. something in our head every day, you don't even know it. Um, it would kick in that like PTSD, I'm having another stroke. I'm oh. going to die. I'm not going to survive this time. I'm going to be disabled this time. I'm going to whatever. And that how just, frequently would that happen, Randy? Uh, it, it, probably more often than I would think it, it didn't start. I, I had my, so, so what it ended up being was, PTSD, yeah. which turned into panic attacks, which turned into depression. Uh, the first one was I had my stroke in February. And I really think the first one was about five months later, where I just and it started with a panic attack. And then what would happen, it would be the depression, which I would call a melancholy feeling, I would tell my mm -hmm. wife, I'm having this melancholy feeling again, mm -hmm. I look back, it was just me going into some kind of funk depression. Yeah. Um, and luckily it, it wouldn't last a long time, but it would happen. Um, um, but it would last a long time from a standpoint, it went on for four and a half years. Yeah. Um, and, and so it would happen a lot when I would be at conferences for some reason, I don't know mm -hmm. if it was the crowds, but the cool thing was people I work with realized what was happening. 
And they like, Hey, let's, let's go outside. Let's leave. Let's go for a walk. Try to get my mind to not think about that. I'm going to die, which I yeah. wasn't, but my mind was telling me that. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I did not, I did not hide this for the most part um, from people, uh, the depression and all that, but I didn't tell them the, 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 the lowest lows that it would happen. Um, but I think it was important to, to be open, to at least share what was going on. I would tell my wife what was going on. And so it, 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 it's not a fun thing. Um, it was my mind in control of me rather than me in control of my mind. Yeah. And so my, my brain would be having these thoughts and ideas that would scare me. And I was like, how do I get out of this? And finally, yeah. it was somebody, a, a counselor that ended up really just listening is what happened um but somehow in her listening she directed me certain ways and i'm making i'm giving you the truncated story which for me that's pretty good so <laughs> truncated. Um, um she got me thinking certain ways and i finally got to a standpoint where or a point where i was sitting in my melancholy place is what i would yeah. call it it's just a place in my house i would go sit when i was starting to get down low yeah and and one day uh four and a half years later uh, and I know this is a, a PG podcast, so I will not use the words I used, um, but I used, uh, let's see, how do I say this? Uh, talking to my head, F you, you're not real, get out of my head, I'm not listening to you anymore. And somehow after a few days of doing that, I just started feeling oh. like you can go away and it's not that easy. Don't, that wasn't the cure all. <laughs> Nobody can use those words and it's going to, you're not a therapist. <laughs> right. And yeah. don't let, but for, for me, that's what happened. And, and so now yeah. I am so happy where I am today and what I get to do and everything that, that, uh, uh, it's, it's so nice. I can go share that story with others, which we I yeah. do it like in an hour presentation. Yeah. Um, even getting CPE out for it now at, uh, um, so I'm doing it in presentations. I'm doing it on podcast. I got one this week that we're, we're going to do this. Uh, I know have CPA firms asking me to come in and do this for them, which I think yeah. is great. Uh, and not from a standpoint, it's me that someone's there mm -hmm. because this is, way too hidden in a lot of places yeah. people are not talking about it. there's a stigma attached to mental health issues it's the person that's living under the viaduct that's got mental health issues it's not the person sitting in the cube next to me that has mental health issues and unfortunately it is and so yeah. let's try to get that out in the open and and hopefully uh you know help people uh get better yeah you know randy as you were you were sharing that that story and talked about the one therapist just listening I, I've seen that a lot in, in uh, my time corporately working with businesses that I've worked with, where when something comes up, it seems to be just kind of brushed aside by those that had the opportunity to instead listen. Yep. And I think that's, you know, I could take a challenge as to my own personal mental health inventory, but I think the greater challenge is how do I respond when I get that weird hint? weird probably not the right word but that different hint mm -hmm. nope. from somebody and how do i choose to listen as opposed to brush it off so yep. hopefully our listeners might choose to listen to that not just the podcast no and that's yeah. that's great well it's listen and then just keep the conversation going even if you don't know what to say you just keep yeah. it going and, and there's certain things i i got a list of like 20 things i'm no expert by any means i'm not <laughs> an expert um, but I got at least the 20 things that I've learned just by being really good at Google um, <laughs> and, and, and researching and that they say, these are the things you should do. So we go through this during the presentation. I love it. Do you have, have you wrote an article on this? Uh, I did actually recently in accounting today, we had yeah. one, which the title was uh, uh, burnout. It's not a badge of honor. I think yeah. that's what it was called because I think sometimes people realize they think I got to work, 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 work. And they think that this burnout is something that just, just comes with the profession and it's not, you're going to be more protective or productive, productive if you take time out for yourself. If you take these breaks, if you're not working Sundays, if you're not working, you know, seven days a week, if you're not working until midnight, Getting sleep. you're going to end up being more productive. And yeah. so we go into that a little bit in that article. I love it. I love it. All right, Randy, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. It was excellent. Uh, I'll put that article in the show notes. And then if anybody wants to reach out and get a hold of you and try merit, what's the best way to do so? 
So you can find all my information on our website, which is try tri merit merit.com. There's a, I think, a meet the team page. I'm on LinkedIn. We were talking ahead of time. Yeah. I'm trying to do some stuff on Twitter. Right. I'm not, I'm not super active on there yet, but I'm getting better. So LinkedIn and our website's the best spot. But if you go, uh, uh, what is it? You you follow somebody on Twitter? <laughs> See, I mean, <laughs> you got it right. Yeah, you follow. Yeah, all right. I'll do some more. You follow and then hopefully you follow back. Yeah, exactly. Right. There you go. <laughs> so that's the best spot. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rory. Thank you, all Randy. Right. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. All opinions expressed by Rob Santos and Rory Henry on this website podcast interview are solely their opinions and do not reflect the opinions of our Root Family Office LLC or their parent company or affiliates, and may have been previously disseminated on television, radio, internet, or another medium. You should not treat any opinion expressed by anyone as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of their opinions. Past performance is not indicative of future results.